Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way which he has consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say, his flesh, in heaven and high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart, in full assurance of faith, having a heart sprinkled from an evil conscience, and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful that promised. And let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as a manner of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. For if we sin willfully after that, we have received the knowledge of the truth. There remains no more sacrifice for sins, but a certain fearful looking for of judgment and fiery indignation, which shall devour the adversaries. He that despised Moses' law died without mercy under two or three witnesses. Of how much sore punishment suppose ye, till he be thought worthy, who is trodden underfoot the Son of God, and has counted the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified, an unholy thing, and has done despite unto the Spirit of grace. For we know him that has said, Vengeance belongs to me. I will recompense, saith the Lord. And again, the Lord shall judge his people. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. We have now reached one of the most solemn and fear-inspiring passages to be found not only in this epistle, but in all the word of God. May the Holy Spirit fit each of our hearts to approach it, in that godly trembling which becomes those who have within their own hearts the seeds of apostasy. Let it be duly considered at the outset that the verses which are now to be before us were addressed not to those who made no profession of being genuine Christians, but instead, and to them who the Spirit of Truth owned as holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling. Hebrew 3 verse 1 Nevertheless, he now dehorts them from stepping over the brink of that awful precipice which was before them, and faithfully warns of the certain destruction which would follow, did they do so. Instead of replying to this with arguments drawn from the eternal security of God's saints, let us seek grace to honestly face a terrible danger which menaces each of us while we remain in this world of sin and to use all necessary means to avoid so fearful and fatal a calamity. In the past, there have been thousands who were just as confident that they had been genuinely saved, and were truly trusting in the merits of the finished work of Christ, to take them safely through to heaven, as you may be. Nevertheless, they are now in the torments of hell. Their confidence was a carnal one. Their faith no better than that which the demons have. Their faith was but a natural one, which rested on a bare letter of scripture. It was not a supernatural one, wrought in the heart by God. They were too confident that their faith was a saving one, to thoroughly, certainly, frequently tested by the scriptures, to discover whether or not it was bringing forth those roots which are inseparable from the faith of God's elect. If they read an article like this, it proudly concluded that it belonged to someone else. So cocksure were they that they were born again so many years ago. They refused to heed the command of 2 Corinthians 13 verse 5. Prove your own selves. And now it is too late. They wasted their day of opportunity, and the blackness of darkness is their portion forever. In view of this solemn and awful fact, the writer earnestly calls upon himself and each reader to get down before God and sincerely cry, Search me, O God, reveal me to myself. If I am deceived, undeceive me ere it be eternally too late. Enable me to measure myself faithfully by thy word, so that I may discover whether or not my heart has been renewed, whether I have abandoned every course of self-will and truly surrender to you, whether I have so repented, did I hate all sin, 
and fervently long to be free from its power, loathe myself and seek diligently to deny myself. Whether my faith is that which overcomes the world, First John 5, 4, or whether it be only a mere notional thing, which produces no godly living, whether I am a fruitful branch of the vine, or only a cumberer of the ground. In short, whether I be a new creature in Christ, or only a painted hypocrite, if I have an honest heart, then I am willing, yet anxious to face and know the real truth about myself. Perhaps some of you are ready to say, I already know the truth about myself. I believe what God's word tells me. I'm a sinner, with no good thing dwelling in me. My only hope is in Christ. Yes, dear friend, but Christ saves his people from their sins. Christ sends his Holy Spirit into their hearts so that they are radically changed from what they were previously. The Holy Spirit sheds abroad the love of God in the hearts of those he regenerates. And that love is manifested by a deep desire and sincere determination to please him who loves me when Christ saves a soul. He saves not only from hell, but from the power of sin. He delivers him from the dominion of Satan and from the love of the world. He delivers him from the fear of man, the lusts of the flesh, the love of self. True, he has not yet completed this blessed work. True, the sinful nature is not yet eradicated. But one who is saved has been delivered from the dominion of sin. Romans 6 verse 14 Salvation is a supernatural thing, which changes the heart, renews the will, transforms the life, so that it is evident to all around that a miracle of grace has been wrought. Thus, it is not sufficient for me to ask if I repudiated my own righteousness, if I renounced all my good works to fit me for heaven, Am I trusting alone to Christ? Many will earnestly and sincerely affirm these things, who yet give no evidence that they have passed from death unto life. Then, what is more necessary for me to ascertain whether or not my faith may be a truly saving one? This, there are certain things which accompany salvation, Hebrews 6 verse 9, things which are inseparable from it, and for these I must look, and be sure I have them. A bundle of wood that sends forth neither heat nor smoke has no fire under it. A tree, which in summer bears neither fruit nor leaves, is dead. So a faith which does not issue in godly living, in an obedient walk, in spiritual fruit, is not the faith of God's elect. Oh, my reader, I beg you to diligently and faithfully examine yourself by the light of God's unerring word. Do not claim to be a child of Abraham unless you do the works of Abraham. John 8 verse 39. What is apostasy? It is making a shipwreck of the faith. 1 Timothy 1 verse 19. It is a harsh departure from the living God. Hebrew 3 verse 12. It is a returning to and being overcome by the world after a previous escape from its pollution through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Second Peter 2 verse 20 There are various steps which precede it. First, there is a looking back, Luke 9 verse 62, like Lot's wife, with all she had outwardly left Sodom, yet her heart was still there. Second, there is a drawing back, Hebrews 10, verse 38. The requirements of Christ are too exacting to any longer appeal to the heart. Third, there is a turning back, John 6, verse 66. The path of godliness is too narrow to suit the lustings of the flesh. Fourth, there is a falling back, which is fatal, that they may go and fall backward and be broken. Isaiah 28, verse 13. Hebrews 10, verse 25. Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together is a manner of some, but exhorting, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. This verse forms a transition between the subject of Christian perseverance treated of in verses 23 and 24, and that of apostasy, 
which is developed in verse 26 and onwards, though it is much more closely related to the latter than to the former. Most of the commentators are astray on this point. True failing to observe the absence of the word, and, at the beginning of it, and because they do not perceive the significance of the word, forsake. In reality, the contents of this verse form a faithful warning against apostasy. First, the Hebrews are cautioned against forsaken public worship. Second, it is pointed out that some had already done so. Third, they are bidden to exhort one another with increased diligence, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together. Before attempting exposition of these words, let us first relieve them of a false application which some seek to make of them today. Just as of old, Satan made a wrong use of Psalm 91, 11, and 12 in his tempting of the Savior. Matthew 4, verse 6. So he does with a verse before us. For you are aware of how often the devil brings a scripture before our minds. When a Christian is seeking to be out and out for Christ, the devil will quote to him, be not righteous over much. Ecclesiastes 7 verse 16. Likewise, when a child of God resolves to obey, 2 Timothy 3 5, and Hebrew 13 verse 13, and separate from all who do not live godly, the enemy reminds them of not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together. Romanists used the same text in the early days of the Reformation and charged Martin Luther and his friends with disobeying this divine command. But God's word does not contradict itself. It does not tell us in one place, Be you not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. Second Corinthians 6.14 And here bid the sheep to fraternize with the goats. When rightly understood, this verse affords no handle to those who seek to discourage faithfulness to Christ. Not forsaken the assembling of ourselves together. John Owen rightly pointed out that there is a cynic doak, a part put for the whole, in the word assembling, and it's put for the whole worship of Christ, because worship was performed in their assemblies, and he that forsakes the assemblies forsakes the worship of Christ, as some of them did, when exposed to danger. End quote. What is here to hoarded? It's a total relinquishment of Christianity. It does not cease not to attend the assembly, but forsake not. Abandon not the assembling of yourselves together. It is not to send us loth or of schism which is here considered, but that of apostasy. If a professing Christian forsook the Christian churches and became a Mohammedan, he would disobey this verse. But for one who puts the honor of Christ before everything else, to turn his back upon the so-called churches where he is now so grievously dishonored is not a failure to comply with its terms. The Greek word for forsake not is a very strong and emphatic one, being a double compound, and signifies to abandon in time of danger. It is a word used by the agonizing Redeemer on the cross when he cried, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? It was used by him again when he declared, You will not leave my soul in hell, neither will you allow your Holy One to see corruption. Acts 2.27 It is a word employed by Paul in 2 Timothy 4.10. Demas has forsaken me, having loved this present world. It is found in only one other place in this epistle, where it is an obvious antithesis from the verse now before us. He has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Hebrew 13 verse 5. Thus it will appear that a total and final abandonment to the public profession of Christianity is what is here warned against. One may therefore discern how the verse 25 supplies the most appropriate link between verses 23, 24, and verse 26. Verse 25 prescribes another means to enable the wavering Hebrews to remain constant in the Christian faith. They were to hold fast a confession of faith without wavering. And if they were to consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works, then they must not forsake the assembling of themselves together. The word for assembling together is a double compound. 
and occurs elsewhere in the New Testament only in Second Thessalonians 2 verse 1, our gathering together unto him, that is, unto Christ. This also shows that the assembling together here is under one head, and that the forsaken is because he has been turned away from. To enforce the above caution, the apostle adds, is a manner of some is. The Greek word for manner signifies custom, and is so translated in Luke 2, 42. This supplies additional confirmation that the evil against which the Hebrews were to hoarded was no mere occasionally absenting themselves from the Christian churches, but a deliberate, fixed, and final departure from them. In John 6, verse 66, we read that, From that time, many of his disciples went back and walked no more with him. John also wrote of those who went out from us, but they were not of us. First John 2, verse 19, Whilst at the close of his labors, Paul had to say, all they which are in Asia be turned away from me. Second Timothy 1 verse 15. So here, some who had made a profession of the Christian faith had now abandoned the same and gone back to Judaism. It was to warn the others against this fatal step that the apostle now wrote as he did. But exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching, here is the positive side of our verse. This is another of the means appointed by God to confirm Christians in their holy confession. To exhort one another is a duty to which all Christians are called. Alas, how rarely is it performed in these evil days. Yet, from the human side, such failure is hardly to be wondered at. The vast majority of professing Christians wish to be petted and flattered rather than exhorted and cautioned. Most of them are so hypersensitive that the slightest criticism offends them. One who seeks grace to be faithful and to act in true love to those whom he supposes are his brethren and sisters in Christ has a thankless task before him, so far as man is concerned. He will soon lose nearly all of his friends and sever the fellowship which exists between him and them. But this will only give a little taste of the fellowship of his sufferings. Hebrew 3 verse 13 is still God's command. And so much the more, as you see the day approaching, there seems a little room for doubt that the first reference here is to the destruction of the Jewish commonwealth, which was now very nigh. For this epistle was written within less than eight years before Jerusalem was captured by Titus. That terrible catastrophe had been foretold again and again by Israel's prophets and was plainly announced by the Lord Jesus in Luke 21. The approach of that dreadful day could be plainly seen or perceived by those possessing spiritual discernment. The continual refusal of the nation to repent of their murder of Christ and the abandoning of Christianity for an apostate Judaism by such large numbers clearly presaged the bursting of the storm of God's judgment. This very fact supplied an additional motive for genuine Christians to remain faithful. The Lord Jesus promised that his followers should be preserved from the destruction of Jerusalem, but only as they attended to his cautions in Luke 21, verse 8, 19, 34, and so on. Only as they persevered in faith and holiness. Matthew 24, verse 13. The particular motive unto diligence here set before the Hebrews is applicable to other Christians, just to the extent that they find themselves in similar circumstances. 